Hello, welcome to tonight's science Q&A. There was one this afternoon. Uh, tonight's is a very specific science Q&A uh, about questions that you've sent in about this pandemic, about uh, research, our understanding of it, and uh, many different ways that you may be, be worried or interested about how it could affect you and your life and all of these things. So we're going to be dealing with that very, very shortly. I'll just quickly tell you a few things uh, about the Shambles Stay at Home Festival, as well as the science Q&As, which are all available on YouTube. Uh, we also have a daily series which goes out at 10 a.m. every Every morning and uh, next week's guests include uh, Russell Kane and Tim Minchin and Matt Parker and various others and you can catch up with all of the things we've done uh, as well I think pretty much everything is on YouTube so we'll get straight on with this day also I should just quickly add we do also have a tip jar at the bottom of this and uh, we are collecting making a fund of money basically for people who are finding themselves with no work whatsoever and at the same time have not been able to access uh, any way for financial support and also to try and make sure that we can support some of these smaller art centres around the country as well, which will be suffering and very often as well as being a place that has shows in the evening is also quite often a social hub for some of those people in isolated areas. So now let's deal with the science Q&A. We are joined, I should say, thank you very much for everyone who sent in questions. Uh, what we've made sure with all of the questions is they've all been run past the experts, the scientists that we have to make sure that they are talking within an area of their expertise or knowledge. And we are joined tonight by Professor Ed File from the University of Bath, who works on pathogen molecule molecular evolution and genomics. Uh, we have Dr. Ellen Brooks Pollock, a senior lecturer, lecturer and mathematical modeler at the University of Bristol, working on COVID 19. Dan Davis, professor of immunology at Manchester University and author of The Beautiful Cure. All of them are going to be answering your questions a little bit later on. But first of all, we're going to go over to someone who's actually one of the reasons, pretty much, that uh, we decided to do this. So I read his article that was in the London Review of Books uh, in the most recent issue, I think. His name is Dr. Rupert B. He is someone who works on cell biology of viruses and uh, is also a doctor in renal medicine. And he's currently clinician scientist group leader at the Francis Crick Institute. So we're going to go straight over hello, to him. Uh, hello, uh, Dr. Bill, Rupert. Hello, and thank you for having me. Um, now, I want to first of all talk about the work that you're doing at the moment, because this does sound like it's very, very important work in terms of trying to work out how to make the virus inactive. Can you tell us what's going on there? part well, of a, a sort of huge program that we are trying to develop um, at the Crick Institute um, in partnership with our local NHS trusts. So at the moment, our institute can't carry out any of its normal research on things like cancer and cell biology and structural biology and all the things that excite us as scientists, because, of course, we've got this massive national and international crisis. So uh, we realized some weeks ago that uh, it would be fantastic if there were more tests available, particularly um, to uh, doctors and nurses working on the front line in the NHS. And we got together with the uh, UCLH, that's our local hospital trust, and uh, tried to work out a way that we could really make this work so that we could deliver um, initially a small number and then a large number of uh, tests to the front line NHS. So um, it's under, underway at the moment. And the very first part of what we do, of course, we've got to make the virus safe. And um, I'm a laboratory scientist, uh, but I'm not a um, diagnostic uh, scientist. I don't usually carry out these tests. And we had no real idea about where to start. But we were very fortunate to get some extremely helpful advice from Public Health Wales, who gave us a great method for both inactivating the virus in a very safe way that would also preserve the RNA. And then my sort of colleagues further downstream in the process uh, designed the, the way of extracting RNA. Uh, none of this is it were, rocket science. It's all sort of standard molecular biology stuff that, um, you know, people knew how to do pretty well in the 80s and 90s. Um, but, you know, it's a question of how to scale it up, how to get all the different components, of, as it were, of the machine to work together. And after a couple of weeks of, I must say, very intense effort by an awful lot of people uh, here in the Crick, um, we think we've got it working pretty well. And we're certainly being able to deliver a very helpful uh, service to our colleagues, uh, like I say, on the front line in the NHS at the moment. I was glad to see when, when we emailed each other. When we emailed uh, each other uh, late last night, or might have even been early this morning, which was uh, you were saying that, that you feel that the front line of the NHS is, is currently holding up. Yes, it is. And that's thanks to the immense dedication and I must say bravery also of uh, my colleagues on the front line. Um, of course, it's holding up because um, we're not doing lots of the, the things that we would like to be doing in the NHS. We're not doing elective operations. We've had to, for example, suspend our kidney transplant pro program. 
um, patients who would otherwise be getting, you know, anti-cancer drugs can't be given those because of the risks associated with suppressing the immune system given the current uh, virus that's uh, that's causing all this trouble. And so the front line is not breaking, but um, that doesn't mean to say that the NHS is functioning normally. The NHS is functioning in a sort of abnormal, supranormal state to keep the um, to keep the conversations that we can have about ventilation in the realms of what normal people would consider to be acceptable and not to be in the situation where we're having to d turn down patients who would um, very likely benefit from ventilation on the grounds of lack of availability. So that's what I mean when I say the NHS frontline is holding and that, that of course is crucial. Um, I was going to ask, um, you, I was gonna you, ask you, you wrote the article that I read on, on the 6th of March and what yes. I found interesting when and then it came out about two weeks later obviously due to the, the you know the, the wake publication but what I found fascinating was you, there's a quote you have from Michael Leavitt who was US Health Secretary in 2006 and he said about pandemics anything we say in advance of a pandemic happening is alarmist anything we say afterwards is inadequate now what you were saying in that article on the 6th of March seemed to as, as you actually quoted one of your friends who said this is not business as usual this will be different from what uh, anyone living with has experienced before apart from since uh, maybe the 1918 influenza exactly uh, exactly now, has it surprised you then that it's really i think only in the last two weeks certainly in in the uk and i would say in the us that we have really had the message sent through to us about the seriousness of this and and people i think have been confused for quite a long time about what they're meant to be doing it's really only in the last 10 days two weeks that i think people I, have i think that's absolutely it astounding that people didn't look at what was happening in China and South Korea and think, well, wait a second, are we prepared for this? Uh, but it's, of course, not just in the UK that people have been underprepared. You can see what's happened in Italy, what's happening in Spain, uh, France, and so on. It's, it's a lot of Western democracies, and that's not even taking into account the crazy situation in the United States. Um, I mean, you can give lots of post hoc explanations for this. Um, but at the moment, in a way, there's not time. You know, we've got very little time to sort this out. And almost whatever we do next, whatever, as it were, the, quote, exit strategy is, it's going to require an enormous amount of very accurate testing to make sure we're getting it right, not breaking our National Health Service and not breaking our economy at the same time. Um, so, you know, to me, it was uh, astounding that we were not better prepared. Um, but perhaps that um, reflects, you know, that important quote that you said that people just don't quite really believe it. And because it, it, no human being until now has any useful memory of any comparable situation, because the last time we were in this situation was 1918. I mean, that's that's one of the problems we're dealing with and all the people's sort of normal responses and all the sort of reassurance you get and so on. Very, very, very badly misplaced. Um, but I, mean, I suppose that's that's human nature for you. We've got a couple of questions that uh, that came in uh, this morning. Uh, the first one's uh, the first one's from uh, Kevin, and he wants to know. Uh, it's probably been asked before, mm. but with this virus, or actually any virus, spreading through so many people, does this give it more opportunity to mutate slightly, creating multiple different strains, or are they stable? Well, the virus does mutate. It mutates uh, further than some other viruses. Uh, the big question there is not so much, is it mutating? The big question is, do any of these mutations really matter? And at the moment, there's no evidence for that. So it could be that we look back when we've got lots more information about this virus, that we work out that certain mutations in the virus made it more virulent and other mutations made it less virulent. At the moment, we do not have that information. And the subtle differences that we're seeing are helpful to uh, epidemiologists because that allows them to track um, you know, uh, certain aspects of the way in which the virus must have been transmitted. But at the moment, we can't talk about multiple different strains of the virus. Uh, I think it's better to consider it to be one virus uh, in multiple different, very slightly, uh, very slightly different forms. But there's no evidence, like I said, at the moment that any of those differences really matter from the point of view of infection. And we have another question. And we have another Nick. question from Nick, who said, uh, "Testing is high on the agenda globally. Do we have any data on how accurate the current tests are in terms of false positives uh, and if, false if false negatives are common? Does that make mass screening a somewhat pointless exercise?" So this is a really important question, and of course, the answer depends on what do you mean by the test. 
So the, the main test that people are talking about at the moment is a quantitative PCR test that some listeners may, may know about. These are extraordinarily sensitive at the molecular biology level. So what we're very good at saying is if we get a swab sample or some other sample that comes into us, does this have particles of virus in it? We're very good at, at, at doing that. And we can detect really tiny amounts of virus in, this, in these samples that we're sent. So they're very, very sensitive. And of course, we make sure that they're very specific. So they don't cross-react with other coronaviruses. They don't cross-react with flu or anything else. What we can't control for is the sampling itself. So if, for example, you're taking a swab from the back of someone's throat and you don't go far enough, well, you might not catch the virus then. And of course, there's nothing that we can do at, in the molecular biology laboratory to make that any better. If the virus isn't there, the virus isn't there. So a lot of this depends on how the sample is taken. But once those samples are taken, they're very sensitive and very specific. And, and this actually generates, in a funny sort of way, another kind of problem. This test is so sensitive that it can pick up absolutely tiny amounts of virus and sometimes when you're doing that in a patient with very low level symptoms or no symptoms at all, you might think, oh, they're infected with the virus. But at the moment, we don't know if that's going to generate immunity further down the line. And at the moment, we don't have good tests for immunity that we can roll out on a large scale. We can do tests at a very small scale, which will tell us if one particular individual has raised antibodies, which you might expect to be protective against the virus, that is possible. At a large scale at the moment, that's not possible. It was very surprising to hear people saying only a week ago that we would have these tests rolled out within days. A lot of my colleagues thought, wow, that's amazing if you can do it. Um, but we were a little bit sceptical. And, and then lo and behold, it turns out that some of these tests are not as sensitive or as specific as, as you might like. And particularly when you're thinking about uh, determining if someone is immune, so there's, there's one sort of idea, which is that you might issue immune passports or something like that. Um, you wouldn't want to give someone the full sense of security that they are immune when in fact they're not, because that could put them at great risk. That might encourage them to indulge in risky behavior. So it would be incredibly important that if those tests are rolled out, they're rolled out only when it, it, it's known that they have a very high degree of uh, sensitivity and specificity. So it, uh, it's a complicated answer to what I think is a really important question question uh just what one final thing which is uh from your current understanding the research that you've been doing in the in the last couple of weeks what do you think is the message you would most like to give to people who are watching now uh, in terms of what they need to understand well the most important message is the message that the government is giving which is stay at home you know do not mingle with other people as far as you possibly can because if you do that will increase transmission of the virus and the nhs frontline will break you know, no resource is infinite, and, and this would be predicted to many, many times overwhelm the capacity of the NHS to cope, and we'd have knock-on consequences across the entirety of care for practically every condition. So I think the most important message is that message, which is stay at home. Um, in the future, uh, there will be other very important messages because, you know, we can't maintain this state, state of, quote, lockdown forever, and there will be some very difficult um, uh, decisions that will need to be made about how we best exit that. My, my best guess is uh, along the lines that Neil Ferguson, many people will have heard him speaking about this, my best guess is that these kind of testing and tracing um, approaches, similar to the ones in a way that are going on in South Korea, that's my best guess about what might be the, the right answer, but that's going to be very difficult. For now, we've just got to stay home, we've got to isolate ourselves and try not to put pressure on the NHS. Thank you very much, Dr. Rupert. Thank you very much, Dr. Rupert Bill. And uh, we may well talk to you again a little bit later on. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, they we're now joined by uh, Professor Dan Davis, Professor Ed, uh, oh, Ed, Dr. Ed and, uh, and, and, uh, and uh, we have, as I said, we've gone through all these questions beforehand to make sure that this is, is covering areas areas uh, of, of their knowledge as well and uh, because as we know there's a lot of misinformation out there and I'm very pleased thank you very much by the way all three of you for for taking time out to to do this um, Ed I'll start with you with a question from uh, Simon and uh, Simon wants to know we, we hear many different kind of uh, possible urban myths and, and stories and he wants to know did it come from eating bats snakes or other wildlife like, we're led, like to, we're led to believe okay so um, it it almost certainly did come from an animal. Um, we don't know what kind of animal, um, but interestingly, um, something that Rupert said just a moment ago there can give us a clue as to its origin. Um, he correctly said that this is 
essentially one strain that we see mutations, of course, because all viruses mutate, but they're essentially uh, very subtle changes. We don't see uh, radically different variants of this virus doing different things, which suggests that there was a single point of origin. So there was one event um, which, which resulted in a, a, a host switch from an animal in, into the human population. Now, coronaviruses as a family have a long evolutionary association with bats. Um, and the closest virus that we know about, um, if you were to consider the whole genome, the whole genetic complement of this virus, um, was from a bat. Um, so bats are indeed implicated as, as a, uh, a source of this virus. Um, if we think about uh, the other human coronaviruses, SARS and MERS outbreaks, they were uh, actually made the jump from different animal hosts. So SARS came from civet cats, uh, MERS came from camels, but they were probably intermediate hosts. They in turn had probably caught it originally from a bat, or if you go far enough back in the chain, it, it, it came from bats. So um, ultimately, all these things tend to evolve uh, in, in bats, most likely. There is a, uh, and the leap probably did happen within this seafood, this wet market. It's, there's still some question marks about that, but that seems to be the most likely hypothesis. And these markets, they bought in exotic species, not just from China, but from all around the world. And they were, you know, the camels and koalas and all sorts of exotic things there. And they were butchered in the market. And that's clearly a bad idea in terms of protecting public health. So I think it's almost certain that it did make the jump from an animal species into uh, humans. And ultimately, the thing would have probably been associated with bats. Thanks very much, Ed. Um, Ellen, we have uh, a question from Nicolette. Uh, she wanted to know, uh, why is this so different to SARS and bird flu? How do we contain them? Well, that, that's a good question, because um, as Ed said, COVID-19 is caused by coronavirus, like SARS, and they're genetically similar and have similar kinds of symptoms. But as was suggested by the question, um, the SARS outbreak in 2003 was contained. It had just over 8,000 cases and 800 deaths over eight months. So obviously many fewer than what we're thinking about now. And there are, there are a few factors that make COVID-19 different to SARS. Um, in particular, how mild, how common mild infections are. So for SARS, peak infectivity usually occurred when the patients were already quite ill with symptoms. So it was fairly obvious who was infectious and who wasn't infectious. And although people can be, could be infected with SARS without having symptoms, there wasn't any known transmission events that happened from people who didn't have symptoms already. So on the other hand, with COVID-19, we know, or that it seems to be, that people with no symptoms do seem to be infectious and can pass the infection on to others. So that means that any control measures that are focused on symptomatic cases like temperature screening, um, isolation, quarantining, contact tracing from symptomatic cases will be much less effective for COVID-19 than they were for SARS. And then just the the associated with mild infections, the fact that uh, COVID-19 has often results in mild infections means that it's much less likely to be picked up by the surveillance system in the first place. So probably once the first cases were detected, there were already hundreds of cases, uh, asymptomatic or mild cases in the community. And then there are kind of other differences as well about the transmissibility of COVID-19 compared to SARS, it seems to spread a bit more quickly. But thinking about compared to bird flu, um, bird flu doesn't spread easily between people. So outbreaks tend to be relatively self-contained. But a good comparison is with swine flu. Um, obviously, swine flu came from the new strain of, it was a new strain of flu that emerged in 2009 in Mexico. And that spread around the world and has now become one of our seasonal influenza viruses. And it's just something that we live with. And it's um, highly likely that that's what's going to happen for, with the COVID-19 as well. It'll just become part of everyday life. Thank you, Anna. The, uh...
Uh, Dan, this is uh, from Alexander, and uh, he wants to know, why is it considered safe to eat takeaway food, but it is not considered safe to touch the box it is delivered in and then touch your mouth without washing your hands first? So this has been a lot of the different kind of uh, where it may well be when people's post arrive, all of those different things, how long to leave it. So can you can you give us a little bit of the background? Right. So, yeah. Hi, guys. So the what is the important that the that we understand the main way that the virus spreads from one person to another is through respiratory droplets which come out as we talk and especially when we cough or sneeze that is the main way this virus spreads so the staying at home social distancing that's why that's so important the there was a paper published um uh, a couple of weeks ago in the New England Journal of Medicine, which uh, I tweeted as soon as it came out, many others did as well, which did look at how well virus particles could live on different kinds of surfaces. Um, and that concluded that for, so certainly for uh, any virus living on a surface, it sort of decays, not li- being, it decays its viability, how well it could survive on a surface, decays quite rapidly uh, over time. Uh, and the sort of they talk about this in the half life. So if you have uh, a thousand viral particles, then how long does it take for five hundred of them to stay uh, viable? Uh, and so the virus could survive uh, longer on plastic and stainless steel, for example, compared to uh, paper and cardboard. So the data really showed that you could still find viruses that were viable uh, seventy-two hours later on steel. Uh, whereas on cardboard, it was about 24 hours later. But then it's, don't forget, it's decaying over time, no matter how long you wait for. So the problem with uh, really giving a public health message about what that means for wiping off surfaces is that it's really hard to know um, uh, whether that affects the clinical situation, whether they're how much of how many viral particles, for example, are needed to infect a person with this virus. We don't yet know. Um, even on, when they looked in, the, in, in, in a cruise ship, there were newspaper reports that 17 uh, days after they cleared out the cruise ship, they could find virus. But that was just traces of RNA. So it probably wasn't that that would be transmissible to a person. So we do know that viral particles can persist on cardboard, for example, for, a, for say, 24 hours. But we don't really know if that has a big clinical impact, whether it could really be transmitted to a person. So Basically, the, the, the direct health advice is the main way it moves is through respiratory droplets. So stay away from people, as everybody knows. And if you get packages, I guess that the, the current health message is just, you know, when you get, you know, when I order a book from wherever, uh, I'll throw away the packaging uh, and the book should be fine because it's already taken a couple of days at least to get to me. So it's, you know, so I think that the main takeaway message is, is we don't know exactly throw away the packaging and wash your hands as a book lover you know that you've given me the most important bit of advice for my ridiculous bibliophile life um it is i, I just want to throw in actually something else that came in from uh, lisa just a moment ago which is again it, it's kind of related which is there are people who are you know very anxious if you're outside and uh, she was asking that in her garden so this person next door will be two meters away but she now you know reached that point where if someone's coughing next door there is a kind of is that going to be okay so so with even with that distance should she feel reasonably safe from what we understand if someone's next door and that you know they're away. Away. dan I'll, I'll throw to you first of all but well, I, any yeah, of you... I think you know we, we we have to be sensible about it so from what we know you, you have to be in fairly close proximity to pick up uh you know respiratory particles that come out from someone uh that, that that's in, infected so that if you maintain a distance you know across a uh, several meters of the garden yeah, i think it, it, it probably is safe but it's also true that you know when there were these you remember the boy in the bubble case when the guy uh, had a completely um insufficient immune system i mean you, you're never nobody's ever entirely safe from any kinds of germs actually you know if you, if you have no immune system uh, or that that person had a genetic a deficiency that made their immune system uh, not work at all uh, and then you know it wasn't that they could just be two meters away from other people that had to be kept entirely isolated so there are 
germs in the air or, 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 or you know you can't be entirely protected but the sensible measures that that is the uh you know staying two meters away from people is going to put you uh a, a, a fair, reasonably safe to all practical purposes here all purposes here sorry ed did you want to add something you just um well I, I was just going to say that um it's it's kind of kind of uh, i think important to understand the distinction between um, the way that the coronavirus is transmitted by droplet infection, um, where there's relatively quite big droplets that tend to fall to the ground within a, a metre or so just through normal exhalation, whereas other diseases like measles, for example, can transmit as genuine aerosols. So they're much smaller and much hardier, so they can actually be suspended in air and survive floating around in air for at all. Um, and we don't think that coronavirus can do that. So it's not like if you're standing in the middle of the field, you're going to get infected. Um, foot and mouth disease was a, was an amazing, I mean, that, that could spread for miles from one farm to another on the wind. I mean, that was in, incredibly um, infectious. So we're not, we're not talking about that particular route of transmission. And there's a distinction between droplet infection and genuine airborne transmission. Thanks. Um, Ellen, I was, this, this may be a very short answer, a very long one, uh, from Alan. Alan wants to know, herd immunity or lockdown? And of course, there's so many people who had so many different <laughs> messages a couple of weeks ago. And again, it's led to, I think, a continuation of uncertainty. Yeah, uh, well, I'd say the answer is both. Uh, so lockdown is, is good because it stops the rapid growth of the number of cases, which can overwhelm the health service. And it buys time to decide what to do. And so I'd say lockdown is, a, is an important part of controlling the um, epidemic. Um, but, I mean, the concept of herd immunity applies to all infectious diseases and is used for all vaccination programmes. So um, you've probably heard when people are talking about measles outbreaks and measles vaccination that you need to get 95% of the population need to be vaccinated to prevent a measles outbreak. That's related to herd immunity. So when there's enough immunity in the population, you don't get outbreaks on average. And this and the herd immunity is related to how infectious the disease is. So if if an affected person infects two other people on average, then you'd need to prevent one out of those two cases in order to stop an epidemic happening uh, in your population. And you can either stop that that second case from happening either by keeping everyone indoors and making sure they don't speak to anyone or you can stop it by making sure that the second person is immune either through vaccination or through natural infection and that would mean that the kind of transmission event would still happen but that person would wouldn't develop symptoms and then wouldn't go on critically to infect others um and so uh, you know kind of herd immunity isn't isn't really a policy as such it's just a, a part of the way we understand infectious diseases and the, the way they spread um in a population um, Ed, uh, simon wants to know was there a covid 18 17 16 etc etc uh no there wasn't the, the 19th the of the year of so covid 19 is just a shortened form of coronavirus 2019 um, and the, the the actual name of the the, well, it's, the name of the virus is SARS-CoV-2, um, and that's that reflects the fact that the closest human uh, coronavirus was was SARS. Some of the other um, more benign ones that cause cold have got snappy names like 229E and NL63. So actually, uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2 is is relatively snappy, but the COVID-19 just just refers to that. That's the disease, and that just refers to the year. And uh, Simon also wanted to know, and you, to some extent, I think you've answered this uh, already, but uh, uh, my understanding is that coronavirus has been around for a while. So I'm guessing that it is either a natural mutation or is it a bio bioengineered for another purpose? Uh, OK, so, know. yeah, so it, it, it's um, probably been around for a while in a, an, an as, as yet unidentified animal reservoir, as I said, probably ultimately evolved in bats, um, but may have existed for some time in another animal reservoir so pangolins have been implicated these lovely scaly creatures um that there's still a question mark about that uh that particular link um so uh 
Yes, it's been around for a while. So it's not a new, it's not new to nature. It's new to us, but it's it's probably been existing and evolving in animal populations for a while. Second part of the question, no, it's absolutely not bioengineered. There's some peculiarities about the virus in that it, it, it didn't seem to, when it made the jump into humans, it didn't seem to have to go through a very much sort of adaptation to make it fit humans well. It sort of hit the ground running and was transmissible you know from the get-go whereas other times viruses make this this jump which is actually quite a difficult thing to do biologically jump from one species to another there tends to be a period where they have to sort of adapt to the new host that this virus didn't seem to have to do that very much um, and that's led to some sort of speculation that is may have been engineered in a lab but it's it's rubbish um, it's, it's it was just just bad luck you know occasionally uh, you know, things things happen like this in nature, and we just have to sort of roll with it. No, it's not bioengineered. <laughs> I can see that uh, Rupert's uh, back on the call so now Rupert. as well. Would you like to add something? I mean, that's exactly right. There's the possibility that this is bioengineered. It's complete nonsense. Um, it came into the human species, you know, probably via something else from bats, exactly like Edward says. It's just very, very bad luck, I'm afraid. It does. It opens up to something which uh, I, I think is interesting. Uh, and I, I think is interesting, and I'd, uh, any of you are interested to know about this, which is we do hear now the speed in which a conspiracy theory, and that can be on so many different things. Of course, we've heard the radio mask stuff. We sometimes hear uh, may well, you know, race based conspiracy theories. They travel very, very quickly. Where would you advise people to find the best sources of information to make sure that when someone confronts them with some of these kind of ideas and these conspiracy theories, they have the information to challenge them? Um, Dan, should I start with you? Is, is, uh, yeah, so, you know, this, you know, I think no matter where our personal politics are, the government uh, is going to put out the best information. And I, I think that's kind of uh, important. Like, you know, people... We, we do need to understand that this isn't a political situation. This is, a, and the government is looking after us. It's, it, it has the access to the best uh, uh, experts that are out there. And, and I am absolutely certain that people, you know, when, when Neil Ferguson comes on TV and says there are eight groups chipping into the mathematical uh, uh, analysis, I absolutely, you know, we, I absolutely believe that. So I actually, you know, pr a lot of people are sort of, you know, raging against policies that the government makes in all kinds of ways and and that that's fair enough in in general life we're in an unusual situation i think the government is going to put out the right information here that they, they are listening to scientists experts nhs workers clinicians and although we need to hold them to account in terms of you know numbers of beds cases testing it's still true that the public health messages that come out are, are the, the best advice really would anyone like to add anything to uh, that? Well, I'd, I'd just say that kind of almost for all the sort of criticism of social media and all for all the, the, the way that is peddled misinformation, misinformation I, found it, I found it that Twitter's really come into its own. Once you find uh, the sort of half a dozen names that you, you trust, you follow those and you just stick to, to, to those guys and those threads. And there's been some fantastic threads and um, from the likes of Adam Kaczarski, Christoph Fraser, uh, Mark Lipsitch in Harvard, Bill Hannage, and they've really helped me sort of keep up to speed. And those sort of trusted sources uh, have have really sort of, as I say, brought Twitter into its own. It's been been quite an eye opener. I've never really relied on it in a, anywhere near as uh, to the extent that I am at the moment. Um, Ellen, uh, well, I've got. We better move on because I've the, the Queen of Harry Cross. If we overrun, <laughs> uh, this is uh, from Andy. Andy wants to know why is this particular virus so incredibly variable when it comes to effects on different people? Symptomless to fatal seems to be a, a huge, huge spectrum. It it is a huge spectrum, but it's actually fairly common uh, to have a large variety of symptoms. So we know that, for example, seasonal flu, many people have very mild symptoms and not even know that they're infected, and other people have very severe complications. And uh, another disease that I spent quite a lot of time thinking about is tuberculosis, TB. And uh, for TB, it's estimated that around... 25% uh, of the world's human population are latently infected with TB, so completely symptomless. And only a very small number of those, probably less than 1 in 20, will develop a cough and the serious symptoms and actually need treatment. So it, you actually find 
it actually happens quite a lot for infectious diseases where you get completely different symptoms for different people. Um, Dan, this is uh, from James. James wants to know, how will we find out if previously infected people can catch the virus again? So what, what do we know about that? Yeah, so crucially important question. And the very short answer is we don't really know yet. Um, so it's almost certain that there will be some level of immunity uh, after you've caught the uh, coronavirus COVID-19 for the first time. But the crucial issue is how long that lasts for. Uh, and we don't know that. There's one anecdotal case that was published uh, fairly recently in Nature Medicine that showed that uh, one per one particular person where they really studied that still had an antibody defense about 20 days after they were infected. Uh, from other coronaviruses, um, it's known that, at least for some of them, there, there's a relatively short-lived immunity, three months or so. Uh, for the last uh, 2003 SARS epidemic, which was also a coronavirus, their protection lasted about a year. Uh, but there is, you know, we don't know. So some experts have suggested, in fact, it could last much longer than that. But the short answer is we don't know. And we're only going to know that, um, you know, as time goes on. This, this virus hasn't been around long enough to know the answer to that exactly yet. Once we have antibody testing and we see if people do become reinfected or not, only then will we really know the answer. And that's an absolutely pivotal question to how we're going to deal with things uh, going forward. Well, Ed, that I suppose well, Ed, also, that I suppose goes, also straight on to, goes straight on to there was a newspaper story. There was a newspaper story today, so I have, I have no idea its validity, but uh, that uh, the government are talking about when certain people who've had the virus will then be moved back into being able to go to work, uh, and the actual possibilities of that. If, if 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 you've had it and you no longer have it, can is that is that a viable with with what Dan's just saying about what we don't know. Is that a viable idea that we will see people going back into uh, into work? Um, um, yeah, it's a good question. So, of course, the, the, these are these are balancing acts. These are trade offs and uh, and ca calculations that we have to make all the time, gauging the risks of of, of uh, making the situation worse against completely tanking the economy and people's livelihoods and all the rest of it. So, we would normally expect. Um, someone to 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 be immune at least for a short time after uh, uh, being infected in this way. How long that immunity lasts? Uh, um, again, we we don't really know. But you know, uh, I think probably our best guess at the moment would be that those uh, uh, other things being equal, those people will be immune. But whether that's whether we're certain enough to lift those restrictions in the way that people are talking about that you know it, it, it's a, it's a, as i say it's a it's a judgment call it, there's 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 we just have to try and find that that balance as rupert said at the at, at the start between protecting the public health system protect you know trying to to, to to keep a lid on this thing and 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 not completely wrecking the economy yeah rupert wants to say rupert something. yeah yeah, I think this is one of not having a, a good testing strategy in place now because we won't know the extent to which people really were infected. A lot of the time from our uh, molecular test, we get a, a good idea of the viral load, for example. It's not perfect, but we get a good idea. And there would be information there that we could then potentially use to give a better estimate in the, our population about uh, how good immunity is going to be. I mean, fortunately, other countries will be collecting this data and and we can hopefully get some insights from them. But I think it's just one sort of example of where testing um, as wide a variety of people as you can would be extremely useful. Um, sorry, yeah. You know, many of these questions are, are, are um, you know, it's really important that in terms of how we're answering them, it's very practically about the coronavirus. But it's also true that a lot of these unknowns are hugely important frontiers of, of science in general. We don't know um, how, how long the memory part of an immune response works, really because we don't quite understand the details about what makes an immune response last for a long time or a short time. It's the kind of molecular details of how that process happens, which is where the gaps in our knowledge are that could have helped us understand this situation. So a lot of the things that we're answering are very practical things, like we need antibody testing, and we need to see what happens to the people. But in parallel to that, we also do need 
or at least this, this you know, makes it very clear that the a hugely important frontier of science is to dig into the vir, uh, virology and the immunology behind all of these aspects of that have a huge impact on our lives. Um, Tamsin, we, we, uh, we, we sorry. Uh, sorry, Ellen, we've got a question from Tamsin, which is, uh, um, we've been talking about the inanimate, we've been talking about Tupperware, we've been talking about uh, envelopes and posts, but now in terms of the animate, uh, Tamsin is worried about um, her cat. And she said, uh, the cat goes visiting her self-isolating elderly parents next door. Could the virus get spread on the coat of the cat? Well, that's a really interesting question and uh, important as well. So basically, kind of, basically, there aren't that many, there isn't that much information about it, but there have been two studies. There was a serological study of about 100 cats from Wuhan, the, where the uh, COVID-19 epidemic started, and also an experimental infection of animals. And... These found, oh, well, the study from Wuhan of the 102 cats from an animal shelter and pet hospital found that cats seemed to be that they could get infected with COVID-19. They were infected uh, during the outbreak. And then that was kind of supported by the experimental infection that found that cats could get infected as well. However, what's not at all clear is what the direction of infection is. So um, it could be that that was just human to cat transmission and then it kind of stopped there. It didn't go on any further. Um, and so, I, I mean, there haven't been documented cases of direct cat to human transmission, but we really know so little about kind of direct transmission between animals. We do know that anim uh, owners and their pets sh quite often share viruses and share bacteria um so it's not it's i wouldn't say it was in, impossible but it's not um i think the human to human transmission is likely to be much more important than transmission via via pets um and then it kind of follows on from what dan was saying about surviving on surfaces you know um the study that he's talking about uh, said that the uh, virus uh, survived on hard surfaces much longer than on kind of rough surfaces. So I'd say that cat fur isn't the ideal surface for transmitting the virus. Um, 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 but that that's not to say it's impossible. But it's it wouldn't wouldn't seem that it was a, a good way to transmit between between um, people and just um, kind of normal hygiene practices are likely kind of washing hands are likely to interrupt transmission both within a household and including their pets so well, that, basically, yeah <laughs> no I was gonna say, one of the important things with something where as, as all of you say there's a lot of unknowns at the moment is also at the same time finding the balance between being very careful but also at the same time not then the cost of anxiety can be very great as well trying to make sure that you go okay i need to be careful but at the same time anxiety can of course create you know an enormous amount of damage as well yeah um, this is, uh, Ed, ask this, um, Reese wants to know why are masks not being encouraged when shopping, et cetera. Uh, now the mask thing seems to be changing all the time again, country by yeah. country, kind of. So I wonder if you can tell us a little bit about that. The mask question is, is, is a minefield because it, it seems to me that it's almost as much a, a, a cultural perspective as it is a scientific question. So there's, there's, there's massive differences in how we we uh, see the use of masks in um, uh, Western countries compared to Asia, where they're actually, um, you know, they're used to wearing masks. So they they so they have. So coming back to what Rupert said right at the right at the start, which is that this is a this is a situation that no one's faced in in living memory, which is which is right on this scale. But you'll have to remember that actually in China and many Asian countries they have experienced SARS and they have experienced other outbreaks and they're kind of they're kind of more there's a there's a there's a there's a much more of a population level mindset so the point of wearing masks one thing that does seem to be clear is that it's more protective for other people so you're more or less you're, you're it means you're less likely if you're infected to pass it on to other people than it is protective to you and so that means that essentially if enough people wear them, then it's almost a kind of like the herd immunity argument. If you get to a threshold 
level where enough people are wearing them then it's good for everybody and this is kind of understood much more in 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 places like china than it than it than it is here um there are downsides um it's not uh fail safe even the surgical masks uh aren't, aren't fail safe um and the homemade masks that uh that that um people are talking about may offer some protection but again they're, they're nowhere near 100 percent. so there is there is a downside that there may be a a, a a false sense of security um that's an argument that's been raised quite a lot that, that you know that people will sort of be more relaxed about the the two meter rule than they would be if they weren't wearing a mask and that's 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 probably a a a, a good point um the other thing you have to bear in mind is they have to be fitted right um uh if they have if you have a beard for example they're 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 less less likely to to uh to have a tight seal around the face so um so that's an important so you, you actually need to know what you're doing with, with the mask and you need to uh, surgical mask that you, you can't use them over and over again as well so that that's another point so so in general probably uh there is a case for saying anything is better than nothing and they do offer some protection and they offer other then and they're protecting other people from you um but then there are uh obviously these cultural issues and uh there are these other issues with with how you uh will behave once you've got a mask on so it, it, it it's really wrapped up in all sorts of complicated factors and that's kind of uh, evidenced by the vastly different way that different countries are grappling with this question at the moment i think i've just read that austria are now saying that people have to go wear masks outside belgium are explicitly saying well no we don't advocate the use of masks at all so there's there's you know big differences in how in government advice big differences in individual attitude towards masks um but generally speaking if you know what you're doing with a mask uh it won't certainly won't do any harm if you are aware that it doesn't offer 100 percent protection and it's by no means a, a a substitute for doing all the normal social distancing thing that we should be doing then um uh then it, it probably is uh offers some more protection than you would otherwise have and that beard element means we could see a real change in the landscape of hipsters bars uh, in 2021 that's going to change everything um dan this for you this is from gary uh gary says i presented symptoms before this was in the news persistent dry cough and pain in my diaphragm as well as discomfort in my upper body around the lungs have i had it and is there a test i can have to check for antibodies so i can help now i'm not going to make you decide say that whether he's had it or not obviously i know you're not going to be able to do that but in terms of the checking for antibodies and then to find out is there anything that he can do about that and whether that will be uh, useful. Uh, in, yeah, so as um, Rupert spelt out right at the beginning, this antibody si testing situation is pivotal to us being able to work out uh, if people have previously been exposed. So your body uh, will produce these antibodies and they're detectable uh, from this finger prick blood test, roughly speaking, maybe two or three weeks after uh, you've, been, you've had... Uh, the, the infection. There are two types of antibodies that these tests will work for. They'll look for what's called this IgM antibody. So that's your early uh, antibody response and then a more uh, uh, longer lived antibody response. A, a longer time after you've been infected, you will have a different form, a different isotype. It's called a different type of antibody IgG. So these tests will tell you whether you're making these two types of antibodies. But the crucial reason why you can't do that right now is because, just like Rupert said in the beginning, it would be a terrible situation if we had tests going out there and they were not entirely accurate. So, in fact, the government policy is about right on this and other countries that, you know, we can place however many orders you want, but we don't want those tests going out until they've been absolutely proven that they are really able to pick up uh, very clearly that you have antibodies against this particular type of virus and they're not going to give you uh, any false negatives or false positive or that's exceptionally rare and that's actually not that easy to do to make sure that you've got antibodies against this uh, a protein for example from this specific virus most of them are looking for antibodies against what's called the spike protein on this virus and you need it to be sure that it's directly looking at that and you won't get any cross reactivity from anything else so we need to wait for these antibodies to be test to be proven 100% accurate before we 
roll them out or you you know so we don't want them being available on amazon or boots just yet we need to be sure they work um ellen you you've kind of answered this to some extent answer this to some extent anyway but i'll ask it because melanie jane is again somebody who's getting very very worried at the moment she said i'm staying home as much as possible trying to keep trips be brief be careful about distancing washing hands etc but i'm so anxious when i get home about whether i'm developing symptoms how long does it take and i know you said but again to try and give us some sense of uh of, of the frame here yeah so um the, she's talking about what's called the incubation period which is the time from when you're exposed to uh COVID-19 to the infection to when you will actually develop symptoms yourself and um estimates of that are around five days so um i mean but, but uh, there have been some reports of up to two weeks but more or less it's fairly consistent they estimated around five days from china and from now from other studies as well and it's probably not less than about three days i think that Right, thank you. Yeah. This is uh, this. I'll throw out to all you. This is from uh, Chris. This is what would indicate the beginnings of return, return to, to normalcy. Normal. Is it that daily number of new cases become zero, and if so, wouldn't that require almost blanket testing to to mean anything? And even after the current lockdown has ceased, will we be facing occasional clusters of the disease over the coming years? Now, again, you've kind of been talking about that. Perhaps now there is a you know it's going to be uh, uh, present from now on. How how would you answer Chris on this? Uh, let's start on. On Ed, if that's okay. Um, yeah, I'll try. I'll try. So, so um, I going what the, the it's it's a really difficult question actually. Um, so um, going with what's happening in China. Um, so they're just starting to uh, ease restrictions now. I believe in in Wuhan. Um, not it's not it's not going back. It's not like we so. We're not going to wake up in the morning and everything will be back to normal. There'll be there it will be carefully managed, um, and some restrictions will be lifted. So um, more shops and businesses will be open. There'll be there'll be some restrictions lifted on movement and travel and all the rest of it. But it won't suddenly spring back to normal. Um, so I think that 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 it's a case that the basically the number of new cases will have to be pretty much nil and for a little while for a week or so before there's we can be really sure that there's actually no more community transmission going on is the way i understand it um so we really so we're 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 at the moment we're still approaching the 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 peak which is actually going to be more like a plateau than a peak so we'll have a maximum uh, uh we'll have a, a, another couple of weeks or so as i've experienced in italy where there'll be a high number of cases and high number of deaths every day and then that will slowly come down but i think that's got to come right down before we even start thinking about changing anything and it's got to have stayed down for a little while to make absolutely sure what exactly it's going to mean in terms of what's going to what's going to start moving first and what sort of restrictions are going to be lifted i'm not really sure but testing will be again this is keep coming back to that this is obviously going to be massively important at this stage in terms of strategy um so at the moment it's important for just practical reasons for getting the 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 uh the healthcare workers back to work if we know they can go back to work it's going to take more center stage in this next phase in terms of, of strategy and understanding exactly what we can and can't do when um we can only make those informed decisions based on knowing where the virus is and how it's spreading and recognizing hot spots and new chains of transmission and all the rest of it so so testing will become more important for that sense rather than the sort of day-to-day -day, let's get people back to work which is why it's important at the moment would anyone like to add anything to uh to that yes yes rupert what yeah. Edward says is exactly right um but i think getting back to normal normal is going to require a really effective vaccine and that is not immediately around the corner. Obviously, there's huge effort going into this, probably more effort into this than any other vaccine uh, over the least at this period of time ever. Um, it, it's speculation, really, about uh, when and indeed whether we'll get a very effective vaccine. Um, I think if you're an optimist, you're probably thinking about a year. And if you're more realistic, you're probably thinking about 18 months. And I suppose that the, um, the, the goal is to get us to a position where there is a successful vaccine that can be rolled out with as little damage 
and as little death um, as possible. And that's going to require an enormous effort, not just on the part of scientists and politicians and policymakers, but on the part of everybody, really. Everyone's really involved in this. Ellen. I was going to say that I was going to say that I think it's difficult to say what the new normal is going to be because if we think of a um, seasonal flu that's associated with several thousands or tens of thousands of deaths every year and that's something that we live with and we consider that to be completely normal and so I think it'll um uh, obviously at the moment we've got an exponentially number of, uh, or uh, an increasing number of deaths this is obviously not a normal situation but kind of in the future i sh i you know i could imagine a normal situation that doesn't involve zero cases and zero deaths but has some kind of baseline number of deaths and cases that is not is not growing but is kind of low and not in an outbreak situation Dan. Yeah, so I know they said vaccine is the really big exit strategy. Smallpox, polio are the examples where that's worked. As well as that, though, there are antiviral medicines being looked at. There are at least 50 clinical trials going on. Uh, HIV, as an example, when protein inhibitors first came out, shifted from being an inevitably fatal condition to something that could be controlled. So there are strategies uh, out there, as well as vaccines, other kinds of medicines, and in the end, no question, our exit strategy is going to come from the scientific research. There are going to be heroes in this story. We haven't met them yet, but there are going to be people that really uncover uh, antivirals that work or a vaccine that works. And that is our exit strategy. That's where, as well as the current dealing with logistics of how we unleash the break up the lockdown the, the for me the big effort should be the scientists in the labs they they're, they're going to be the heroes in the end thank you so much thank you all thank of you. you thank you all of you uh that was uh, what is what's what's depressed me about that is the fact that i've already crossed out every single piece of work i had all the way to june and i think i can probably manage to cross out the summer as well now so uh um thank you very much uh, the, 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 by the way the final question we had which was a, a, a lovely which was just can people on the iss be guaranteed to be covid free so there's a uh, on the international space station it's a classic kind of dystopian cinema moment isn't it they look down upon the world and think we may not go back for a while i'm not sure when they went up there though so we can't be entirely certain i presume um anyway uh thank you very much everyone uh thank you ed thank you ellen thank you rupert thank you dan uh everyone watching this go and uh, they they are all on twitter so go to twitter and find the other places where you can find because these are all people who are updating information all the time putting out articles there which are all very very useful thank you very much everyone for uh for watching this we're back tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock with a very different show with russell kane and uh matt ricardo who's a juggler if any of you can juggle you come on on as well but why not and uh and then we have tim minchin on tuesday as well at 10 a.m and as i said if you've enjoyed this and found this useful and i hope you have found this useful and it really was wonderful everyone who's been part of putting this together uh if you any money that we managed to get together is going to be put together as a resource to help people who are uh, currently at the moment kind of hitting the wall and also to help those uh, those art centers and other venues we were talking about and those social hubs thank you very much enjoy the rest of your sunday i hand you directly over to the queen bye bye Hi.